motorsport, like art, like design, like anything, is a product of its culture. It's not a coincidence that rally comes from Northern Europe. NASCAR is distinctly American. And if you've seen a Formula off-road video, you probably didn't have to guess that it came from somewhere really interesting. Iceland. For our last day in Iceland, the weather was perfect for pretty much anything, especially Formula Off-Roading. This is the real reason we came to Iceland. I mean, who in my position wouldn't want to meet the kind of maniacs who get in a Jeep and drive vertically up a mountain face? I had to do this, and I didn't know anyone else who had ever done anything like it, which is why JF called Hofsten Thorvalson, multi-time Formula Off-Road champion and president of what I believe to be the only Formula Off-Road school in the world. Where else besides Iceland do they do Formula Off-Road? Sweden? And where else? I don't, in the Nordic countries, the guys are out of their minds and have nothing but spare space and adrenaline. Off-road Iceland is not like Skip Barber. You don't drive to a school with a huge pit and a bunch of cars ready to go up the mountain. You meet at a gas station in the middle of nowhere on a road east of Reykjavik. Apparently everyone in Iceland knows about this gas station because it's the last gas station before you get to the winding roads over the mountain. We waited at this gas station until an enormous blue racing rig arrived and they waited for us to follow. When, when the vehicle transporting the vehicle you're supposed to get in looks more badass than anything else you've yeah. seen, yeah. you're in for a train. Down the road, in the shadow of this enormous mountain, covered with ice, is what appears to be a mining facility, abandoned, now just a rock quarry. Jeff had arranged for us to meet with Hofsten Thorvalsson, CEO of Off-Road Iceland, the premier formula off-roading school in the world. Hofsten's been doing this for four years. He came in second, third, and was also the world champion. So we've come to Iceland to meet the guru of off-road racing, Hofsted Thorvalsson, the president of Off-Road Iceland, who's gonna to explain to us the history, the background, and teach us about the most, I think, unbelievable off-road sport in the world. Hofsten, mm -hmm. <laughs> how did this start? Well, actually, first, explain to me exactly what Formula Off-Roading is. Uh, Formula Off-Road is all about uh, making uh, trucks, a uh, hard one, and trying to get up the hill to the top without touching any marks. And, and is it judged solely by distance up the course? Yeah, this is all about just getting to the top. What is Formula Off-Roading? A purpose-built Jeep, which may look like it's ready for Baja, but it's nothing like a Baja car. A Formula off-road car has maximum horsepower. And they've got over six, 700 horsepower. Minimum weight, no surprise there. They weigh under 1,500 kilos. And they have nitrous, a low center of gravity. Tires that literally are claws, scoops, designed for one purpose to go up a near vertical, if not completely vertical grade and crest the top. Now mm -hmm. I've never seen in any Formula Off-Road video a car actually finish a course. <laughs> How often does a competitor actually finish a course? Uh, if the course is very good, then maybe one or two will finish it. I think the course is really bad if everyone finishes it. So. Okay. If you, if you finish the track without any minus points, the highest points you can have is 350. And how does one lose points? Uh, on the way up, there are marks, uh, are gates, and if you touch the marks, you will get a minus point. And if you go in reverse, you will get a minus point. Uh, as far as I could tell, no one was doing a good job except the guy who made it to the top. But 
There were winners who rolled over and only made it halfway and went back up again. How exactly did formula off-roading as a sport begin? It was about 30 years ago in Iceland. A guy starting to come together and driving up some hills and then they start competing and now they are competing in Europe. And, and what were they driving in the beginning? Uh, usually uh, Jeeps. What kind? Like Jeep Wranglers? Like 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 four by fours? Like what, 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 no, what exactly? The Jeep Willis, you know. Sure. So the original World War II US Army yeah, Jeep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And today, something like this. Mm -hmm. What exactly is it based on? All made by hand. You know, we we built the cars by ourselves, and we try to have it as strong as we can, also as light as we can. And I see that you still put the. Uh, Willie's you know, <laughs> style front on the car. What yeah. kind of engine is running this? So this is an unlimited class car. Yes. This, so what kind of engine do you have in here? Uh, it's a 434 small block uh, from Scott Shafiro. SS version, uh, strong, very strong, good engine. Well, we have a very good suspension, you know. So, because we are jumping sometimes very high and and it's very strong. We have the strongest axle you can have, and the transmission is very strong. The transfer case is custom made, very light, and also very strong. I mean, let's reiterate the specs 700 plus horsepower, 1400 kilos, and nitrous, and a vertical cliff wall. So before I get in the car, do I have to sign any kind of waiver? What is a waiver? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. All right, that's interesting information. I'm very excited about this. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, nice. I'm so excited. This is the last time we shake hands. So, <laughs> all right. Hofstin warmed up the car by creating a symphony of violent horsepower and a rain of rocks over where we stood. I watched a little apprehensive. In Iceland, you compete with the car culture you've got, or so said Donald Rumsfeld. In this case, Formula Off-Road. So that looks very impressive. Was that uh, an easy little just fun practice run for you? Yeah. Is how much more difficult is a competition than what you just did? Well, the difference, uh, the difference is you never have any speed before the track. You stop all of in the. You have no speed. Right at the vertical point, and then you yeah. power up. And then we have a steeper. Steeper than that. I see. All right, let's get in the car. I cannot wait to try this out. And I'm not afraid like those guys from uh, that other British show. All right, cool. <laughs> that a certain host of a certain car show had just been here and that he begged to get out of the car because he was scared. I wasn't getting out of this car. All right, so if I feel ill or sick, what do I do? What's the, what's the symbol, signal to stop? All right, so if I just go like, well, have you seen uh, Team America World Police? So if I go like this, you know what I mean. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Right. Not a problem. Apparently, Hans devices are not standard, which I find insane. 
So with my wimpy little donut, I strap myself into the seat of this car. I was a little nervous, but I figured we roll, cage, this is part of the sport. We went up the mountain, you know, halfway, a little bit, kind of, you know, teasing the bottom of the slope. And then he began going up sideways, kind of trying to find the grip and maybe find a pathway up. Then he made the first leap over one of the crests. Then he leapt over an even higher angle crest. Then he came to literally something, I, there was no way we could get up this thing. We made the jump over the top, and when we landed, <laughs> and he went like this, I almost gave a thumbs down. But I didn't, because I was hoping that at the end of this, he might let me take the wheel. And he did. Obviously, this guy didn't know me very well, because generally, no one ever lets me drive their cars, except for another guy who didn't know me in El Salvador. But I got behind the wheel. Oh my god. Okay. Oh, I see you're much skinnier than I am. Oh. Oh man. Oh god. I could be your father. How old I am? How old are you? I'm 35. Okay, I couldn't be your dad. <laughs> he said there was nothing I could do to break this car. Nothing I could do to hurt it. It's an automatic transmission. It's got three forward speeds. It's got a starter button. It has an emergency kill switch. There was nothing I could do to break it. I could only hurt myself. In fact, Josh and Jeff both said, don't try to prove anything. And I completely lied and said, don't worry, I won't. But I really want to take that thing up that cliff face alone. So I hunted for a spot with an angle not too crazy. When I thought I found it, I punched it. As amazed as I was, I was even more amazed by the fact that there was a sheer drop on the other side from the top of the crest and that I was about to tumble head over first and wreck this car. Thankfully, the engine died. <laughs> the engine started. I got it reversed and brought it back down. <laughs> that was really exciting. <laughs> that was amazing. Hofstin, um, you're an amazing teacher. Yeah. Um, you're like a psychiatrist and a champion all in one. I, uh, I'm going to come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not signing any waivers. Waivers are for cowards. <laughs> this is the best thing we've ever done in this show. I can't wait to come back. Hofstin, yeah. thank you again, man. Nice to have you. In the Iceland wiki, it's mentioned frequently that these are very self-sufficient people. I mean, my idea of self-sufficiency is uh, I can cook for myself and I go to the ATM myself, order food for myself, um, and um, that's not what self-sufficiency is. I mean, we're talking about a country that was founded by conquerors who brought with them women they kidnapped from France and England and made a very nice life in this difficult land, chopping down every tree. 
All that would suggest a violent people, but the Icelandic people are in fact not in any way violent. They're considered one of the most peaceful nations in the world. The third best country in the world in which women can live. A country with no nuclear power, it's all geothermal, where you don't need to sign a waiver to get into a race car and risk your life, with minimal crime, and a sport that pits maximum horsepower, minimal weight, against a vertical rock face. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it does make perfect sense if you consider that these are people who have no enemies except nature itself. And so, of course, their homegrown form of racing doesn't pit car against car, it pits car against nature, in the same way that the Vikings conquered nature to carve out a life on this frozen rock, which isn't really frozen because the people are warm. It's kind of awesome. And if you look around, there's geysers everywhere. It's a cold planet. It's a desolate planet. It's a it's an equine planet. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> Um, Iceland is not known for architecture or famous buildings or really anything of the sort. It's known for its landscape. What other country in the world can you honestly say the culture is actually embedded in the landscape and nowhere else? And can you also say it must have been pretty damn cold in Sweden and Norway that the guys thought they'd have a better life here. And it must have been pretty damn cold here to think that they kept going west and got the Greenland to be better there. And it must have been pretty damn cold for them to leave Greenland and go to Canada and think it would be better there. And you know where they ended up? In New York. That's where I'm from. And let me tell you, I can't wait to go back. It is absolutely freezing in Iceland. And that's why they call it Iceland.